demonstrates that the theory of evolution is useful for making sense out of biological observations. According to an article published in the journal Nature in September 2005, more than a century ago, Darwin and Huxley posited that humans share recent common ancestors with the African great apes. Modern molecular studies have spectacularly confirmed this prediction. One notable difference between humans and their ape relatives is seen in their chromosome numbers. What follows is a detailed history of scientific discoveries concerning human and great ape chromosome numbers. In 1958, researchers definitively confirmed that humans have 46 chromosomes. Two years later, in 1960, researchers determined that the chimpanzee chromosome number is 48. The following year, 1961, researchers determined that gorillas and orangutans also have 48 chromosomes. Since chromosomes come in pairs, this means that humans receive a set of 23 chromosomes from each parent. In contrast, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans receive 24 chromosomes from each parent. This means that humans have one fewer pair of chromosomes than their ape relatives. Scientists were initially puzzled by this apparent discrepancy. Over a decade later, in 1975, researchers used various techniques to compare the chromosomes of humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. Their analysis confirmed the hypothesis that the four species descended from a common ancestor. In 1980, researchers noted the striking resemblance of the chromosomes of humans and chimpanzees. The banding patterns were a near-perfect match. A couple years later, in 1982, researchers noted that a specific pattern in the middle of human chromosome 2 bore a resemblance to the ends, known as telomeres, of two separate chromosomes in the great apes. Using evolutionary theory, the researchers hypothesized that human chromosome 2 must have resulted from the fusion of two separate chromosomes that would have been present in the common ancestor of humans and the other great apes. This is a perfect illustration of why evolution is considered a real science. Molecular geneticists were now able to use evolutionary theory to predict what they should find if their hypothesis was correct. In 1991, researchers tested the chromosome fusion hypothesis by sequencing the previously discovered telomere region in the middle of human chromosome 2. What they found were stretches of DNA that are normally found in telomeres. This discovery confirmed the fusion hypothesis. A year later, researchers detected an inactivated centromere sequence in human chromosome 2. Chromosomes usually only have one centromere. The second centromere sequence was located right where expected based on the corresponding chromosome in chimpanzees. After another decade, researchers were able to map the precise fusion point on human chromosome 2 and describe its structure in detail. Finally, in 2005, researchers published the definitive study describing the initial sequence of the chimpanzee genome. What it showed was a break in alignment continuity at precisely the locations predicted by the fusion hypothesis. It literally took decades to uncover the explanation for the difference in human and ape chromosome numbers. I hope you noticed that the scientists responsible for these discoveries were not limited to simply noting the similarities and differences in the chromosomes. They could actually discover the causes of those similarities and differences using evolutionary theory as their guide. Also, scientists did not just run across this evidence and then later claim that it supported the common ancestry of humans and great apes. Instead, they used evolutionary theory to propose a testable hypothesis, to form predictions, and to test those predictions by examining the chromosomes. Clearly, evolution is real science. Now, if you're biologically astute, you may be thinking, wait a minute, a species exists as a population, so how could two chromosomes fuse together and end up being found in all the members of a population? The explanation is actually quite simple. The animations that follow will illustrate one possible scenario. The most probable time for two chromosomes to become fused is during meiosis, the process used by organisms to produce sex cells. If a fusion event were to occur in one of the sex cells of a primate with 48 chromosomes, the resulting cell would have only 23 chromosomes instead of the normal 24. If this cell went on to be involved in fertilization, the resulting offspring would have only 47 chromosomes. This primate with 47 chromosomes still has all the genes necessary for survival. In fact, it very likely would have been indistinguishable from other members of the population. But this primate would have produced sex cells with either 24 or 23 chromosomes. When this individual reproduced with a normal individual, 
approximately half of the resulting offspring would also have 47 chromosomes. The next part of the explanation may seem a little freaky because it involves inbreeding. Recent estimates indicate that early human populations were likely very small. In small populations like this, considerable inbreeding is known to occur. If two siblings with 47 chromosomes were to reproduce, there would be a 1 in 4 chance of producing an offspring with 46 chromosomes. Continued inbreeding could result in a small group of individuals that have 46 chromosomes. Although reproduction can occur with uneven numbers of chromosomes, it is more likely to occur successfully when the chromosomes exist as pairs. For this reason, once a small group of individuals with 46 chromosomes appeared, these individuals would have produced more offspring when they mated with each other than when they mated with individuals that had 48. As a result, the 48 chromosome population and the 46 chromosome population would have diverged over time. All humans on the planet today are the descendants of the population with 46 chromosomes. So, there you have it. Simple genetics combined with cutting-edge molecular research leads us to a powerful explanation of a large set of biological observations. These observations only make sense using the real science of evolution. I'm Jeremy Mohn. Thanks for watching my video. This video lesson has been brought to you by Stand Up For Real Science, a website devoted to defending the teaching of mainstream science in public school science classrooms. Visit us at www.anevolvingcreation.net slash standup.